All right, everybody. I'd like to welcome you to our webinar today. My name is Martin Bezener, and I'm the president and CTO at Stadies. Today, we're going to be talking about space filling designs and how to model uh, uh, Gau basically Gaussian process models, so data that's collected as, as part of a space filling design. So today's topic is going to be a little bit advanced. We did this webinar about a year and a half ago, and we've updated it a little bit and are doing it again so that more people can uh, uh, get this information. So once again, welcome and thank you for, for attending. And my email, my personal email is right here. It's martin at stadies.com. So if you have any questions or definitely if you have any feedback on either this webinar or the space filling design capabilities in our software, please feel free to email me at, at any time. I'll, I'll try to get back to you as, as soon as possible. Uh, we definitely take all of your feedback into account when we're designing features and improving them and modifying them and so on. So just a little housekeeping. We do this with all of our webinars. We do have a decent sized group here today. So to prevent any audio disruptions or anybody accidentally leaving their microphone on and dogs barking or, or kids crying in the background, we've muted everybody just to avoid any, any, any interruptions. You can ask questions in that little questions widget, the tool in GoToWebinar. I'll try to periodically peek at those and answer them in real time. However, if I don't get to it, please either email me, martin at stadies.com, or you can also email stathelp at stadies.com, which goes to me as well as our other consultants right here. So if I'm out of the office or I'm busy doing something like this webinar right now, somebody else may see it and might be able to get back to you sooner. And as always, this presentation, the recording and the, the slides will be posted to YouTube and our website probably by the end of the day. So if you need to leave early or you wanna watch something again, don't worry, you'll be able to get this information. So what are we gonna talk about today? So first I'm gonna talk a little bit about our new software product, Stadis 360. Now most of the of the capability of space filling design as well as Gaussian process models. Most of that is in our new product, Stadis 360. So I'm going to just talk a little bit about that and introduce it so that you're aware of it. Then I'm going to talk about space filling designs. What is a space filling design when you might use one? We're going to talk about two cases here. We're going to talk about space filling designs when you're doing simulation experiments, as well as space filling designs when you're doing physical experiments in the lab. So there's really two uses for them. They're commonly associated with simulation experiments and, and computer experiments and, and, and whatnot. But I think there's a lot of cases where you might wanna use them when you're just doing a typical experiment in the lab. Then I will talk about uh, Gaussian process models. So if we do collect data from a simulation experiment, it needs to be modeled a little bit differently than we normally would with something like linear regression. So I'll talk about Gaussian process models. And then finally, I'll do a couple demos and, and then give you some pointers on if you want to use this information, <clears throat> if you want to use these tools going forward. So quick, very quick and brief introduction to Stadis 360 here. Now, all of you here, if, you, if you're familiar with Stadis, you're probably aware of Design Expert. It's been one of the leading software packages in, in the design and analysis of experiments, which we call DOE, Design of Experiments, DOE. It's been around for a while now, going on 40 years. Originally developed in the mid 1980s by Pat Whitcomb, who was the founder of Stadis. He's retired a few years back, though he's still pops up every once in a while to do to help us out or do special events. And Design Expert really focused on design of experiments. It focused on cutting edge, easy to use tools. And the most important thing is 
the tools were always designed in a way that you didn't really need a master's or, or a PhD in statistics to be able to do most of the, to be able to use most of the functionality in the software. I would say 98% plus of our users are engineers, they're chemists, they're scientists, they're, um, they're university researchers in the hard sciences. We don't, so, so we've, so it's really, been focused on making things easy to use now unfortunately that also means that we've had to simplify keep the software simple so that it's easy to use and unfortunately it's also meant that we've kind of avoided putting in some requests for for more advanced more technical features over the years we've received a ton of requests for for things like gauge r and r or SPC, statistical process control. Typically, we've always said that that's not our focus. We don't really want to put that into design expert because it's just going to bloat the software and only a very small fraction of our users are going to be using these tools. But we've gotten more and more requests over the years. Now, eventually, the demand just became too great. And so we released Statis 360. This was released about a year and a half ago, October 4th, 2021. Now, Statis 360 is essentially a pro version of Design Expert. It's a, it's, it's a Design Expert plus more tools, tools that are not necessarily strictly DOE or tools that are a little bit more advanced than what most of our users would need. So it contains, Statis 360, it contains a full copy of Design Expert software, so you don't need both of these. However, uh, the first release back in October of 2021, the first release of Statis 360 also contains some of our most highly requested advanced DOE features. So things like space filling designs, Gaussian process models for zero error data, meaning data collected as part of a simulation experiment. We also have a scripting capability in Statis 360. So if you like to write automated scripts, if you like to do simulations within the software, if you wanted to move data from another software package to Design Act or Statis 360 and then move it back, you can do that with, with Python. This is one of the most popular software, uh, one of the most popular programming languages nowadays, so you don't have to learn anything proprietary. It's a good bang for your buck to invest in it. And then recently, just uh, as of a few weeks ago, we added an Excel import wizard to Statis 360, and we also added the capability of the software to do random blocks. And this spring, we'll have a few more features put into Statis 360, which are Gaussian process models for any data, meaning if you have error in it or if you don't have error in it, as well as a couple other things as well. So just this is the last slide on Statis 360. So going forward, Design Expert, which you may be using now, will continue to be uh, supported, developed, and maintained, but it'll be targeted towards engineers, formulators, and uh, anybody that's working in R&D. We'll put all of our new features, all of our new easy-to-use bread-and-butter techniques into both Design Expert and Statis 360, but the more advanced non-DOE and highly technical and computational features are only going to go into Statis 360, and some of the most popular requests we've gotten over the years have been measurement systems analysis, multivariate analysis for processes that may have more than one output, uh, advanced scripting and computing, and a bunch of other stuff. So keep an eye out for that in case if it's something that you might be interested in. So having said all of that, why don't we go ahead and move into talking about space filling designs. So space filling designs, I consider them to be a category of DOE, just like response surface designs, just like factorial or mixture designs. I consider them to be kind of almost their own category of experimental designs, whose goal is to basically spread out the, the way I always like to explain it intuitively is they spread out the runs nicely in your experimental design space. The goal is, is that you don't want a design that has any large gaps in the design space, so areas that are devoid of runs. And you generally also don't want regions in your design space where you have too many points that are clustered there. 
And I'm going to show pictures here in just a second so that you could see an example of, of what I mean. Space filling designs in the literature and in numerous courses and presentations are commonly associated with computer experiments. I'm going to talk about what a computer experiment is a little bit later, but it's essentially a DOE that's done on a computer. It's 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 you're not doing something in the lab and measuring the output. You're essentially writing a simulation or using other software to create a simulation that gives you your responses. So you're setting the factors, you're running the simulation, and you're getting your outputs here. For whatever reason, space filling designs and computer experiments are, are pretty tightly linked, but I think that space filling designs also have a lot of uses in physical and traditional experiments. And I'll give you a couple examples where I've used them over the years. And the one nice and yet kind of annoying thing about space filling designs, in my opinion, is that it's still a fairly active research area. So you, there's always, you know, you don't always have the answer that you could go to in the back of the book so on sometimes you need to go look in in journals sometimes you need to create your own solutions and it's not always obvious what the base best space filling design will be for a given set of, of factors and constraints and outputs so it's really still kind of a developing area and that's kind of nice because there's lots of uh kind of solutions that we can still find but there's also some i've run into some cases where i wasn't able to find really what i thought was the best a solution for my particular problem. So here is an example. I always like to start with a, an example, a counter example. So here is an example, very simple example, two factors of a design that's not space filling. So notice that the orange points are the data, or they're essentially the, the, point, the runs that you're going to do in your experiment. You have factor A here and you have factor B. And you notice that in this red circle of doom here, you have almost no runs, okay, or you basically have no runs here. And yet here at this corner in this blue circle, you have a bunch of points that are clustered together. So this is what I would consider to be not a very space filling design because it doesn't fill all of the space nicely. It doesn't spread the points evenly apart. Here is an example of a design that is space filling. So. You could see that the points are spread apart nicely. There's no large gaps. There's no clusters of points. So if we were looking to get information on as many unique points in our design space as possible, as many unique locations in our design space as possible, a, a design like this intuitively, I think, would make sense, right? The points are spread far apart. There's really no gaps. They're all the points are kind of roughly equidistant from one another. So this looks like it fills the space pretty well. And now we'll answer kind of a few different questions. First of all, what is a computer and simulation experiment and why is it so associated with space filling designs? What are some examples or major classes of space filling designs? Can space filling designs be used in physical experiments? This is something I very rarely see addressed in textbooks, in examples online. So here are a couple, I'll give you a couple cases where I, I think they could be useful in physical experiments. Some strategies and tips, and then a couple demos here on how to use space filling designs in Stadis 360. So for those of you that are familiar, are not familiar with computer experiments, computer experiments can differ from physical experiments in the following ways okay so if you're going into a lab you're basically setting up your uh your, your experiment you're setting your factors or your mixture components or whatever it is and then you're measuring the output now notice that in, in, in if, if you're in a physical experiment you might be able to do you might do the same experiment over and over and over again on different days or in different locations and you're not going to get exactly the same measurement each time because there's measurement error and you might not set everything quite precisely and so on. However, in a, a computer experiment, there is no error. If you run the same simulation, you're gonna get exactly the same output over and over and over again. So it doesn't make sense to do things like replicates. So a computer sim so the key is that a computer simulation rather than a physical experiment in the lab is run to obtain the output. 
Now, as I said, repeating a simulation for a certain set of input factors will usually produce identical results or results that are functionally identical, that are just the same out to many decimal places. And in a, a simulation experiment, oddly enough, even though it's a computer that's doing the work for you, it can be extremely time sensitive to obtain a single run. I mean, we're talking hours, days, or even weeks. And because there is no error, certain features of experimental designs in things like central composite designs that have replicates don't really make sense to do because if you do a replicate in a simulation experiment, you're generally gonna get the same response over and over again. So it's a waste of time and resources to do replicates, okay? And now I do wanna make just one caveat here. I didn't put this bullet point on here. Every once in a while, I run into situations where somebody is doing a physical experiment and they're actually getting very, very precise replicates. So if they are doing repeats, meaning they're replicating the entire setup, measuring and so on, and they end up getting, for the same conditions, they end up getting almost identical physical measurements. Everything I talk about here can also be applied to setups like that. Now, typically in physical experiments, we deal with the opposite situation where we have very noisy data and we, we find it very difficult to replicate certain uh, situations. But there are the, the odd situations where everything is very tightly controlled and there's very little noise and the measurements are very, very precise. So doing replicates in a situation like that might not might also not make sense. So if you're in a physical experiment like that, uh, everything I'm going to talk about here is basically <clears throat> basically going to apply. So here, you know, here's kind of the classical difference between a physical experiment and a simulation. Uh, wind tunnel testing it's very expensive, very time consuming. So you would configure our aircraft here, you'd put it in a wind tunnel, and then you'd measure your responses, whatever they may be. In a computer experiment, you'd ideally have some sort of simulation written up, or there's software that can do simulations for different types of situations. <coughs> and you would run the simulation and then measure your outputs here. So, um, as I said, because the output has no error, replicates don't make sense. <clears throat> and designs for computer experiments are typically space filling. In other words, <clears throat> excuse me, they aim to cover the design space without leaving large gaps between the design points. So replicates don't make sense. And if we're gonna get all of this very precise information from each run, we want to, basically cover as many unique locations in the design space as possible. Okay, so let's go to next. So now, if you're doing space filling designs in Stati's 360, here's, I'm not gonna open up, oh, I guess I could open up the software and, and, and show this, but um, we do have essentially a separate category in our software, I'm going to show it here. As you see, you have space filling right here and you have Latin hypercube or optimal designs. So going along with that, Stati's 360 does have two major offerings for space filling designs. So we have kind of the classical Latin hypercube designs, and then we also have optimal space filling designs, some that are model-based and some that are strictly distance-based. And we'll go through all of these cases here. Every I, I would bet that most people have heard of a Latin hypercube design, but maybe have not used it or haven't ventured out to try to incorporate it into their own work. So I'll talk a little bit about what a Latin hypercube is here so that you're aware of it. It's a very, very popular design. And here's the setup here. You start with K factors and you divide each factor into 
p levels here okay in fact i think it should be um the same k uh I, I may have changed from p factors to k so i believe this should actually here now it, it should be these the p and k should be the same here um so here's a situation where we have a latin hypercube designed in two factors okay oh no i'm sorry it is it it, it it is it is different so here we have two factors and each one is divided into seven levels here okay um here we have two factors we have factor a and we have factor b and each one takes seven unique levels there's no replicates here now kind of the secret sauce with the latin hypercube design is that if you ignore a factor for example if i end up ignoring factor a and i just collapse everything down to to b here i'm going to get a one factor design that has no replicates so in other words if i end up removing one of the factors or ignoring one of the factors because maybe it's not significant or i don't care about it anymore i'm going to get a smaller i'm, I'm going to get a design with fewer factors that doesn't that still doesn't have any replicates in it so that really is the key for example if i had a point here okay and i also had this point here and i collapsed it and i got rid of factor a what would happen is i would have two points here on top of each other and i'd have a replicate and the and the, the the same thing holds true for any factor if i ignore any factor here for example if i end up ignoring factor b and i just want to go to i just want to keep factor a so i move all the points down here to go along the factor a axis i do not have any replicates in the factor a space so that is the key is that i can go down a dimension or if i have more than two factors i can go down multiple dimensions and i still end up with a design that's ideally space filling and unreplicated so that really is the secret sauce with a latin hypercube design optimal space filling designs are generally built now probably i think everybody here has hopefully heard of us of an optimal design it's a design it's a computer generated design where you give the you essentially put the ingredients into the software and then the software will kind of take them and tailor the design to, to your specifications. And space filling designs can be built the, 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 the same way as usual optimal designs, like D or I optimal designs. A very popular criteria for building these designs is the maximin criteria and what this does is this tries to build a design that maximizes the smallest distance between two runs i want to give a, just a little warning here is that when somebody says space filling there it's there isn't exactly one definition of space filling there's for example minimax designs which attempt to minimize the maximum distance between two runs there's maximin dis runs which go the other way and maximize the minimum distance between two runs so there are uh there's spherical designs there's several different cr space filling criteria you can use so not all space filling designs are created equally now maximin designs i think are are, are very popular and they it's one of those things where i think that a maximin design will work well or good enough in at least 80 to 90 percent of the cases out there where it's kind of like the central composite design where it doesn't it rarely fails uh, catastrophically so if you do build this in stati 360 you'll see and i'm going to show this later you'll see an interface that looks something like this where you have uh, a search criteria here you have uh, an optimality you need to choose you need to put in how many space filling points you want if you absolutely want to force in replicates you can although it's not all that common um, unless you're doing a physical experiment and then if you want to force in a center point or more you can still go ahead and do that okay Now, this is the part that I think uh, that, that I think is kind of underrepresented in the real world, and that's when would you use space filling designs for physical experiments? So I just talked about why you would use space filling design for computer experiments where you have no error, where replicates don't make sense and you want points to be spread out far apart. But this is something that I think is very rarely mentioned, and it's why would you ever use 
uh, oops, sorry about that. Why would you ever use a space filling design for a physical experiment? I mean, aren't uh, the optimal designs the best? Aren't uh, I optimal designs the best? Well, no, not necessarily. Here are some cases where a space filling design might be useful in, in physical experiments. So the first one is when you know the experimental error or when the experimental error is very low. When you have almost no error in a physical experiment, and I realize this is not an everyday situation, when you have very low experimental error, replicates are, are not gonna be of much value because you do a replicate, you essentially get a, 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 measure, a response that's almost identical to the previous replicate. And in this case, a space filling design could be useful. And over the years, I have seen some cases where, uh, where, where, for example, your response is something like a count from zero to 20. And generally when you repeat, you know, there's no measurement error because somebody counting from zero to 20 is rarely gonna mess up. And the experimental conditions were very tightly controlled. And when you did the same run over and over again, 99 out of hundred times, you would get seven as an example. That was one example that I that I that I, I can think of off the top of my head. In a case like that, doing replicates, I think, is going to be uh, it's not it's not really going to give you any additional information, but it will use up more resources. So a space filling design could be useful there. If another one is <clears throat> if you are performing an exploratory study on a new design space. So let's say you're in a new problem, you've got factors that you may not have worked with before, you might not even know the operating bounds of your process, then a space filling design might be useful because a space filling design is generally gonna spread the points out into as many unique locations as possible and it's not gonna leave a bunch of large gaps in the space. So if you're doing range finding or you're trying to do a preliminary experiment to kind of figure out where the bound, your operating bounds are, a small space filling design might might be a decent idea because it's going to test many unique points and it's going to spread them apart from one another. So this would be when you're looking for to el eliminate combinations of your factors that are not feasible that produce that produce a non-response as we call it. So something like a 0% yield in a chemical reaction. And what this can do is this can further refine the design space. Finally, another one where I think a space filling design, and this is one where I, I, I think, once again, it's, it's not really mentioned all that much in literature, is if you expect your response to be very curvy or spiky, meaning you've got this big space, and maybe in a small region of that space, you have a huge spike or you have a huge valley or something like that. Well, if you want to if you want to improve your chances of detecting that, then a space filling design again is not going to be a, ba a bad idea, and it will generally have a better chance of detecting that isolated spike or or valley better than a design that's got a bunch of replicates loaded into it and is only testing three levels of each factor. So, what do we mean by all of this? Well, exploratory experimentation. So, the second uh, point here, the this point right here. Here, if you're in a new design space here, let's say that you've got two new factors and you don't even know where you're experimenting. And let's say you do, uh, what do we have here? Here we have, I think, 10 runs. And let's say you do these 10 runs and the blue runs are, are acceptable data. It might not be, your, your process might not be fully optimized here, but it's at least giving you evidence that you could do runs here. And then maybe these runs here are totally useless. You know, you're getting, Equipment malfunctions, you're getting 0% yields, you're getting stuff that's, that just doesn't make sense. So what you could do with this information is realize that in my second step, when I'm going to do the DOE, a more formal DOE, I don't want to be experimenting here anymore. Okay, maybe I want to be experimenting, you know, maybe my cutoff is going to be somewhere roughly along this red line. And if I had done a de-optimal design or even a face-centered design, it would only test, uh, it, it would not put all of these points here in the middle, okay? Another one is if you, if you 
If the response you're measuring is, is spiky or has a small region of unusual behavior, then a space filling design, again, as I said, is going to be more likely to, to find out or, or figure out where that's occurring. So here is just a random process that I, 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 I found. And this is a response curve. And notice how the response curve is generally flat, okay? Except in this one small region here in the middle, okay, where there's a spike. If you just if you do a typical de-optimal or i-optimal design for like a quadratic model, you might get you might only be doing runs that are like here. Whoops, you might do two runs. Whoops, two runs here at the edge. You might do one run here, and maybe you might do two two runs here on the other edge. That would be a very typical setup for an optimal design for a quadratic model. But if you were doing a space filling design, you might do the five runs that are spread apart more nicely here. So this would increase the chances that one of the runs picks up on that spike. Okay. Obviously this is a case where it looks like the spike is in the middle. So maybe a, an optimal design would work, but if you had a spike that was out over here, then any points at the edge or the center are not gonna detect it. A space filling design might give you a little more evidence of, of where that spike is occurring. Okay, so hopefully that gave you, I know uh, that, uh, I know that was kind of a lot of information if you've never seen space filling designs before that might be a lot to take in but uh hope but again there's only so much we can do in, a, in the 45 minutes that we have together and this is uh, almost i would consider to be a, a crash course in the topic if you if you haven't seen it before so now we're going to talk about modeling so we talked about collecting the data as part of a space filling design but now we're going to talk about how to model this data meaning how to create a model how to optimize things like that so the next question is, is how do we analyze this type of data? So first of all, if you use a space filling design for a physical experiment, and the physical experiment does have some error in it, then you could use OLS, you could use linear regression there. That's kind of the easy case. And believe it or not, I know some people, a few people here and there that do space filling designs, for everything because they think they look nice and there's no large gaps in the space. Even though statistically they might be inferior, some people still use space filling designs all the time. They always spread the points apart nicely on a grid and they use OLS and they're happy with their results. However, if you're in the low to no error case, Ordinary polynomial models, so things like a linear, quadratic, cubic model, are often not going to be adequate for modeling data that comes from a computer experiment or a physical experiment with little error. Because again, there's no experimental error and all of the statistics that are reported along with regression, with linear regression, assumes that there's noise in the process. So not the best, uh, the best idea. Also, typically with space filling designs, the data that tends to be collected is often um, not perfectly quadratic, or it's not really approximated well by a linear or quadratic or cubic model. So Gaussian process models are a little bit more flexible. And I think the best way to show what a Gaussian process model looks like is, is graphically, I think, that the math behind it and 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 the the statistical theory behind it is, is is a little bit complicated so i'm gonna not cram it in in the last 10 minutes here but instead show what it would look like so let's just do one example here so suppose we collect data from a, a computer simulation experiment that looks like this so we have one factor and we have our output response that we're measuring here and of course this could uh this could have taken months to collect these six outputs or it could have taken a, a few minutes so we have a space filling design and we have something we have a curve that goes up and then drops down and then slowly tapers off as you go towards the upper end of your factor if i fit now here once again the key here is is that there is no error if i were to redo 
a run at factor A of zero, I would get exactly the same run. So in other words, if I were to put a confidence interval around these points here, the confidence interval, I mean, doesn't really make sense. It should have a width of zero because I know I'm certain that my true response is that. So if I fit a polynomial ordinary least squares model, here's an example of one that would, I think this is a quadratic model here. So you'd notice that there's, the quadratic model is modeling a lot of error here at these endpoints. And it's also modeling a lot of error, it's also modeling error at each of the runs. We know that these runs don't have error. So essentially the model should go through these points and predict them perfectly. You could make the case and say, well, I'm gonna use a high order polynomial model. I'm gonna use a fifth order model and that might work. That might give you a usable model, something that looks like that. The problem is, is that the confidence intervals are still gonna be wrong. On top of that, Gaussian process models, as I'll show you here, are a little bit more flexible as well. They allow you to, to, to do some things to fine tune them. So clearly a, a polynomial model wouldn't work here because we really want the line to predict perfectly at the runs because there is no error. In normal physical experiments, we'd say, well, we don't want the model to predict perfectly because then it's likely overfitting, but this is a special case here. So to kind of wrap up this, this, this spiel here, the big issue is that the model should predict the responses perfectly if there is no error. It's generally impossible to do this with the polynomial model unless the model has as many terms as there are runs in the data set. So if we have 10 runs, we fit a, what, a, a polynomial model with 10 terms in it. Gaussian process models are one tool that are used to model this type of data. So basically zero or very low error data. And we're gonna show how to do this with the Gaussian process model now. So now we're gonna move into the demos section here. And I'm gonna show you how to do this. We'll play, I'll, I'll, I'll play around with this for a few minutes to show you kind of what happens if you do this as a, as a polynomial model and what happens if you do this as a Gaussian process model. So the first demo, it's a one factor experiment. The purpose, now this is not super realistic in the real world, but the purpose is just to show you the user interface and show you how to use Gaussian process models. Now this is a real data set and it's one factor, which is time and time goes from zero to 100 minutes. And the response is obtained via simulation. So these researchers, they wrote up a script to simulate some factory process. And then they plug in into the, they plug in a number from zero to 100 minutes, and then they get an output. So, so repeating a simulation at the same time will produce the exact same output, so re re replicates are not necessary. And the simulated response, I believe, was expected output of the factory line, uh, something along those lines. It's been a while since I've seen this example, but we basically have one factor and one response, and the response is obtained by by a simulation that these that these I, I think there were industrial engineers had written up, and they did a total of six simulations here. Okay, so I'm going to move to the software here just so we can uh, so we can show this this example here. So this is our one factor example. And if I, so you can see that this is a space filling design here. Randomization doesn't really matter if you're doing this, uh, if there's no error here, because the responses should be totally uncorrelated from the order in which they were done. The order should have no effect here. So the randomization is not really um, a thing here, even though it's still randomized. So I'm gonna look, first look at the data, go to this graph here custom graphs. So you'll notice in, in the newer versions of our software, we have a lot more functionality with graphing here. You can do things like now I can size by uh, a, fa uh, a response here. If I wanted to make, if I wanted to see where I have small responses and where I have big responses, I can change the shapes. I can do 3D plots. I can do a bunch of other stuff here. So this is just as an FYI, but I could see that clearly my data is my responses are increasing over time, but I also see that this, uh, and I'm gonna go ahead and remove this, uh, this uh, 
size by here, by none. I can clearly see that my data here isn't very nice. I mean, it's not following a very nice quadratic curve. It's definitely not linear. So I could try to transform it if I really wanted to, but because there is no error, and I know that this data is simulated, it comes from a simulation experiment, I would use a Gaussian process model would probably be the best idea here. Now, of course, starting in, in, in the recent versions, you could model the same data in multiple different ways here. I'm gonna model it in two ways just to show you kind of a side by side here. I'll do linear regression here. So uh, notice here how you could you also have some options for special models like Gaussian process models. If you have count data, you can do Poisson regression. If you have zero one data, you can do logistic regression. So we've really filled out our special models here quite a bit. So I'm gonna go ahead and click on start analysis here. And this is basically just the usual uh response surface polynomial model that you get here it's suggesting a linear model uh you can see i'm just going to jump to to this plot here you can see that the model doesn't really fit the data very well and you can see that the error bars here don't really make any sense because this data again is is almost no no or almost no error and you could say well let's try to fit a fourth order model to see how things you know how how things look well um it looks like the model is doing a little bit better of a job of going through all the points okay it's close not quite there but you can see that the error here makes absolutely no sense and if i wanted to saturate it completely i believe i can do this then it's going to give me all these warnings here and then I do get something that goes through here perfectly, okay? But the problem is, is now I don't have any, any error bars in between. I should have confidence intervals between the points. I should not have them at the points because there's, I'm predicting with 100% at the points. Also notice here how I start getting output that's going below zero here. So that's what somebody might do. All right, well, let's look at the Gaussian process model here. So I'm gonna click on special models and I'm gonna choose the, you know, Statis 360 and Design Expert will generally only give you the options that are valid. Like it's not gonna offer you logistic regression if it doesn't, if it sees that you have responses that are like 34.6. The only special model here that you could really use that makes sense is zero error. Also, account data doesn't really make sense because we have decimals here. So the, our software will generally offer you only the things that make sense. So let's go ahead and start the analysis here. There's only one factor here. And there's a bunch, there's some parameters you can select here. There's things like the smoothing parameter, the fitting method, which you can select over here. Unfortunately, we are running a little bit low on time. So there's only so much I can't go through every single detail here, but I'm just gonna show the graph here. There's really no model here, like an equation here, because what you're doing is, is you're almost doing like a weighted averaging of the points to one another. Notice that here, the model predicts the points perfectly. It interpolates, and it's gonna interpolate based on the smoothing parameter you set in the factors, but it also does offer some uncertainty about the intermediate times. So you do get quite a lot more information here than you normally would. <clears throat> and somebody just asked, is there a prediction equation? And the answer is no, because it's essentially an, uh, a weighted where, you know, if you want to predict at a time of 30, what it does is it takes a weighted average of a bunch of points, depending on the smoothing window that you specify. And going on from here, again, because I do want to show the second example, things like the optimization, numerical optimization, you could do it exactly the same as you, as you would before, where you can maximize and minimize. And what you might have is that some of your responses are optimized or, or fit using a Gaussian process model. Some are fit using ordinary least squares and, and whatnot. You could mix and match and the optimization and all the other stuff still works the same. So for the, inch, for the sake of time, I'm gonna move on to the next example here. The second example, again, it's a real example from the medical device industry. 
and we didn't we weren't able to get the, the exact factors and responses because of uh, confidentiality but the idea is essentially the same and what the r d team was doing here is they were developing a new artificial joint and this is a very common application of simulation experiments they what they wanted to do is see how the stiffness of an artificial joint changed as two factors were varied now unfortunately uh you can't it's not easy to experiment here by putting in an artificial joint into somebody and then seeing how how it moves how much tension there is and so on and so on so the first thing what they did is they they did a computer experiment because the joint they know the properties of the materials there's physical equations that can be used to kind of figure out the the stiffness and and, and whatnot. So there's a lot of physical equations that they information that they can combine into a simulation experiment to get some data on on what's going on. So what they did is they created a simulation that described how the stiffness of the new joint was expected to change as two factors were tweaked. And the simulation was very time consuming from what we understood, where one run took about 40 hours of uh, 40 hours to obtain. And they did this this data set and then they did a lot more follow-up and, and whatnot this is just a very early stage experiment simulation experiment they did this on eight different computers with each computer doing one of the runs and within two or three days they they had their data set so i'm just going to go ahead and briefly show this um just so that you're aware of this i really wish we had more time to go into a lot more detail here but we do have some tutorials and and case studies on this. So here was the data that they had obtained. They had factor A, which they coded, factor B, which they coded, and then the stiffness of the joint. Now you could, of course, if you really wanted to, I'm gonna go ahead and look at the uh, the graphs first here. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna size, so this is factor A and factor B. I'm gonna size this by the, the stiffness so I can see so I can see that generally the bigger points are, so what I could do here is I could see that generally the bigger points are red and, I'm sorry, the larger stiffnesses are bigger circles and they are colored as red. So, so you could see that this is kind of a very interesting uh, data set here. In fact, what I could even do is I can make this uh, the z-axis. I could see, let's see if this works. If I can make this as a there we go. I can make this as a 3D plot. Okay, so here's my design space. So I could see that there's like these two corners where I'm getting really high stiffnesses. My low stiffnesses are here in the middle, uh, and I'm clearly not getting something that looks perfectly that looks uh, like a quadratic model would work. Again, because this was a simulation, so this data should be should be perfect so if i wanted to i can fit this with linear regression i'm not going to to save time i'm just going to show what the gaussian process model looks like here you could see that i can put in factor a and factor b so if i end up realizing that factor b is not important or i don't want to consider it anymore i could take take it out but i'm just going to leave it in here so this is the one factor plot and this is what the 3d surface looks like here where you can see that the that the model here is going through each of the points perfectly and it's also interpolating in between here if i look at a contour plot i get something that looks like this this is not very easy to make with a polynomial model where i get these kind of twists uh at the opposite corners of the design space so if i wanted to find the joint that had uh the lowest stiffness i would need to be at one of these corners here if i wanted a very stiff joint i would be at the corners here but i believe they wanted something uh something in the something in between the lowest something around like 102 so if i add a flag they wanted to be somewhere in the middle here okay and all of the usual options, things like a one-factor plot, a perturbation plot, interaction plots, uh, those are still available here. Here's what the interaction plot looks like. And the predicted versus actual, again, 
Gaussian process, this iteration of the Gaussian process models will, will fit the data perfectly because it's no error. Now, in the next version of Statis 360, we will have Gaussian process models that are a little bit more generalizable because some people really want to use a Gaussian process model because they have a very curvy, spiky response, but they also have error in their process. So that's coming in the next few months. And then from there, you would go ahead and optimize. You'd go ahead and try to, you know, maybe do some confirmation runs and whatnot. And you would use this model in just the same way as you would use a, an ordinary least squares polynomial model. So to conclude, space filling designs are an interesting class of DOEs that I think have many practical applications, some of which are not very well known. Space filling designs are tightly linked with computer experiments, but they can also be used in physical experiments as well. And as I said, some people like using them in physical experiments just because they look nice. I mean, I don't necessarily agree with that, but, but it, hey, it's something that's done. Stadis 360 offers a solid foundation for anyone that wants to use space filling designs in their own work. And here's kind of some features that we have coming up here. So space filling designs for mixtures, uh, designs that incorporate categorical and numerical factors, Gaussian process models for any data, meaning even for physical experiments, as well as some more advanced tools and statistics. So if you found this useful, I would encourage you to check out the trial. Um, now here, I'm just going to point out one last feature of Statis 360, which is uh, Python scripting, because we've got, I got some questions about this before this webinar. So I just want to point out that Statis 360 does include the ability to write Python scripts. Lots of people will do the simulation and they, they want to do the DOE in Statis 360, then they do the simulation in Python, then they use Statis 360 for, for graphing and whatnot. So here's what you can just, here's just a small sample of what you can do. You could write scripts to automate routine processes, do simulations, you could combine features with uh, our software from relevant Python packages like scikit-learn. If you want to make some incredibly complicated graphs that we can't do on the GUI, you could do it using matlibplot or whatever else in Python, uh, as well as facilitating the import and export of data between Design Expert and other software. So this is if you open up Statis 360, you can open up this script editor here, and here's where you would write your script. Our software is here in the background, and here's where the output appears. And we do have several YouTube videos, as well as a couple tutorials on getting this set up. And this will we'll have a few more things coming out this spring as well. So, so I want to thank guys. I, I do apologize for going a little bit over our 45 minutes here, but I do want to thank everybody for attending. Uh, hopefully you got something out of this. I know this is a somewhat more of an advanced feature and we're happy that we got a we got a pretty good turnout here today. So once again, thank you. And please feel free to send me any feedback here, martin at statis.com. Or if you want something a little more urgently, we do have our stat help at statis.com email that you could contact as well. So thank you once again. And we hope that you'll join us uh, for another one of these webinars in the future. So bye-bye now.